I'm Sarah Norcross and I'm the Director of PET, Progress Educational Trust, a charity which works to improve choices for people who are affected by infertility and genetic conditions. And today I'm going to interview Dr. Sarah Martins de Silva. Um, and we're going to be talking about male fertility. And Sarah is a clinical senior lecturer in systems medicine at the University of Dundee. What are the most common fertility problems that men face? It's estimated that one in 15 men have fertility problems. Um, probably about one in 100 men produce no sperm at all. So the majority of men either have a low sperm count or poor sperm swimming. Now we can do a kind of a barrage of investigations looking at hormone um, uh, reasons or, or genetic reasons, but in most cases we don't actually find a, an explanation for it. And I think there's this huge black box of male fertility understanding generally in terms of what is it that causes low sperm count and poor sperm swimming, we don't really know. What are the, the treatments that you can offer men when, you know, when, when there are such gaps in the knowledge? Most of the time we resort to IVF treatment with ICSI, where we physically inject each egg with a, a sperm to fertilise the eggs that way and create embryos that are subsequently uh, used uh, in treatment. I think... Um, you know, there's a few exceptions where we do have uh, treatments that can correct hormone problems. If you've got very low hormone levels, we can give injection medication to replace that. Uh, but most of the time, there really isn't anything there else that's, you know, a robust prescribable treatment, either tablets or injections or, or anything else. It's a very frustrating situation, I think, for clinicians and hugely frustrating, I'm sure, for couples that are affected by this. ICSI, as you said, is, is a common treatment then for um, male factor fertility. And I suppose the, the difficulty perhaps um, is that it's not, um, it doesn't fix anything, it just helps um, your partner to get pregnant. It's a great treatment for a couple that are affected by male infertility, but it doesn't address the problem. It doesn't correct the problem. And it's clearly a very involved treatment that, you know, is focused more about, you know, the, around the woman and delivering treatment uh, that she has to go through in terms of hormone injections, egg collection, uh, and so on. Um, for the male partner's health problem, um, that's, you know, an injustice in its own right. But as you say, treatment like that is not guaranteed to work. We have a live birth rate of somewhere between 30 and 35% most of the time, but as women get older, that goes down. And as you say, if you have a child, that's fantastic, but it, then you start all over again if you want another child, uh, unless you have embryos that are frozen and stored from your first treatment cycle that haven't been used. Do you think that the success of ICSI has perhaps held back research into um, looking at the underlying causes of male fertility. You have a problem, you have a medical solution, and therefore, you know, it decompresses the need, the intensity to develop other treatment options. So yes, I'm sure that development of ICSI, you know, it was a huge, massive, you know, step forward. And, you know, I, I don't think that anybody would criticise the use of ICSI for male infertility when there isn't anything else to to offer couples. I don't think it's overused. I think male infertility is, you know, definitely the, the correct um, indication for ICSI. I think the criticism of ICSI is that perhaps it's uh, utilised in other situations where perhaps it isn't clinically indicated. That's clearly not the <laughs> focus of our conversation. What um, do you think is in the pipeline then for um, for treating male infertility? We've had quite a lot of stasis in the field of male infertility. And I think we have to be optimistic about how things are starting to move and how developments are starting to happen. In the last 10 years, we've had a fundamental and phenomenal amount of uh, increase in knowledge in terms of the basic biology, how a sperm swims, how it finds an egg, how it fertilizes an egg. And now we're looking really to develop male diagnostics. So understanding how to test sperm better. And when do we understand where sperm do or don't work, then we can kind of plug in therapeutics to, to meet those various deficiencies or dysfunctions, whatever that might be. So I see a future where we'll be able to 
diagnose men better, we'll be able to segment treatment to appropriate um, treatment. I don't think that ICSI is not going to have a place in the future of male infertility, but I think there may be a group of men that we can treat in a different way, treat them directly to solve their medical problem rather than going down the route of ICSI. And I think that's exciting, but it's it needs funding, it needs um, you know, kind of engagement, involvement from researchers, from patients, uh, recruitment into trials, all of the things that are, you know, are starting to happen. And I think uh, the future perhaps looks brighter than it did a decade ago. It's looking more positive now. Why is that, do you think? For any type of um, development, whether it's, you know, scientific, commercial, whatever, you need buy-in from various elements. You need patients to have a voice and say, this is a problem and we need answers. I think we as clinicians have always seen that there's this real desire from, from uh, men to, to have treatments that are for them rather than uh, dragging their you know, partner into treatment. Um, and I think, you know, as you say, then there's this wider aspect of either commercial investment or uh, grant funding investment and having researchers that bring credible projects and credible solutions that are worthy of funding. So I think you need that kind of magic alignment of all of those different elements. In Scotland, a lot of those things do align um, because, you know, as well as you at Dundee, there are others at Dundee and in Edinburgh who are looking at, at male factor. Scotland has had, you know, strong representation within uh, clinical reproductive medicine, but academic reproductive medicine. Uh, you know, we're really lucky in a way that we're a big country, but we're a small reproductive community. So there's a lot of collaboration. There's a lot of communication. Um, and, you know, within the four NHS clinics, obviously, we work quite closely together. And certainly since the pandemic have been much more in contact with each other. Um, so, you know, on a clinical and a, an academic level, there's perhaps more link up and more obvious um, link up than uh, both clinically and and on a research level. Do you think there is still quite a stigma around it or do you do you think that now at that time has passed? There's still a you know like you say a stigma or a shame attached to it it's not an easy conversation and yet when conversations start then I think others that are affected realize they're not alone. I think um, you know the 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 reality of the numbers is that you know one in 15 men have a fertility problem one in seven couples experience issues uh, and difficulties conceiving if it's not recognized to be a medical issue and a medical need then you know you you don't have the same urgency of, of, of need to develop treatments and to attract funding into it you know there's as many people affected by fertility issues as there are suffering from diabetes in this country we've got a new thing here because we're all used to now with the pandemic meeting electronically and you know um you know it's something that perhaps two years ago you wouldn't ever have thought about having some sort of national you know link up you know because it's fine if you're in London that's great if you're in Scotland that's not great if there's a meeting in London whereas actually now with the internet with all of these electronic platforms it's you know entirely feasible to join wherever you are in the world. What are you most um, looking forward to hearing about at PETS events? What's in the pipeline for male infertility? Tiffany Woods is CEO of Dynaval Limited. They've come up with a system that they've designed to try and uh, improve diagnostic semen analysis using artificial intelligence. That could be a real game changer in terms of understanding the uh, characteristics of spermic, understanding you know, maybe what makes a good sperm or not understanding male fertility better. So they're going to be talking about their, their, their system that they're trying to bring to market right now. Jamie Chilton, who is from St. George Street Capital. Now, you may not have heard of them. Their real remit is to try and drive uh, bringing to market drugs um, that have kind of got some early phase uh, work done, but we need to take them through bigger trials um, and, and kind of sponsoring that and, 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 and uh, crowdfunding and, and uh, attracting uh, grant funding as well to try and drive uh, medical interventions in areas of unmet need. And, and, and they've obviously identified that male infertility is one such area of unmet clinical need. So we originally collaborated with the uh, with AstraZeneca, the drug is originally um, developed as, as a treatment actually for um, a, a completely different condition. Um, but we did some in vitro work, so lab work in Dundee, looking at the effect of this drug on 
sperm. And what we found was that actually about one in three sperm samples, and these were clinical samples left over from treatment and so on, responded very positively. We could improve the way that the sperm sw swam and so on. And so we couldn't really work out it, the, the way that the medication works is, is kind of all to do with oxidative stress and, and the impact that our uh, metabolism or lifestyle might or might not have on a sperm cell. So when we looked at the patient samples, we couldn't really pick out those where we, you know, to, to, to kind of try and predict which men sperm would respond and which wouldn't. So it's entirely plausible that this could be something that is, you know, developed for all men having fertility treatment. But ultimately, what we really want to do is take this into the next stage of, of clinical trials. So this is phase 1B and then phase 2 clinical trials. So seeing how does it work when a man takes that tablet and does it still have the same effect that it does when we add the, the drug directly to sperm in a lab. So that's um, really exciting data, really exciting. I think it'll be the first randomized clinical trial uh, for male infertility in the UK. Um, so uh, I think that's pretty exciting um, for unexplained male infertility. How did you first start working in, in male um, fertility? I was previously working in Edinburgh and when I worked in Edinburgh um, I uh, took some time out of clinical work to do a uh, MRC clinical research fellow post and my uh, research at that time and um, working towards my MD was all to do with um, trying to understand eggs and how eggs develop in, in the ovary, uh, which happens when we're a baby in our mom's tummy. Um, and also then looking at in vitro maturation. And I ended up doing quite a mad and bonkers project out at the Roslyn Institute, uh, maturing uh, cow eggs and then uh, cloning them. Uh, so that was all quite fun and exciting. And so I guess I always had it in my mind that I would sort of work in the sphere of eggs rather than sperm. Um, but as, you know, kind of, uh, I don't know, I guess opportunities arose and I ended up uh, moving to Dundee for, for a, a clinical research, uh, an academic, um, but also clinical job. Um, it uh, dawned on me after I arrived in Dundee that it was very sperm and not egg centric. Um, and so um, kind of, uh, I guess, by almost default, sort of switched uh, from, from one uh, gamete to the other. Uh, and... Uh, I think this probably then resonates with the, the kind of research that I'm also involved in, which is trying to understand fertilization better. So having built up a, um, a knowledge and a, an experience now in, in, in sperm biology and, and understanding male uh, fertility, um, the interaction then between the egg and the sperm and how an egg is fertilized by a sperm and the activation that needs to happen following the egg and the sperm uh, meeting uh, is is you know now a kind of I guess a fairly logical conclusion to my my backstory of my research experience. It's incredible uh, being in Dundee, working alongside uh, Professor Barrett and Vanessa Kay and some of the others that are there. It's been uh, an amazing uh, decade of of, of uh, learning and achievements and and understanding. And we continue to build uh, critical mass and and make it bigger and better as as time goes by. I sort of wanted as well to thank the team at Dundee. Um, who have been a great support to PET um, over the years and both um, last year and this year doing um, sponsored walk, cycle, run, um, etc. Um, to the, the, the distance equivalent of traveling where a lot of people would normally be traveling to, to the big um, ESHRAE conference um, to raise funds for us. So um, thanks for doing that again. Last year we got to Copenhagen and then we stopped. So I said, if we get to Paris, we have to come back. So. Uh... <laughs> We'll try and uh, notch up the miles, as you say, on foot or on bicycle or any other sort of means of, of travel um, uh, using our own steam, clearly. Thank you very much, Sarah. You're welcome. <laughs>